Thank you very much. And I, I have to say your pastor has also had a big influence on me. I, I appreciated his faithfulness, his service uh, for the Lord for so many years, and uh, faithful ministry of the Word. Uh, there's, uh, you, you may or may not know how rare that is uh, today. It's, it's becoming more and more rare, and, and that'll come out somewhat in our message today. But I thank you for men like this who continue to serve the Lord uh, faithfully and diligently uh, year after year. Uh, in several locations throughout his ministry, and the Lord has always blessed the word under his teaching. And you're a privileged people to have him. I hope you realize that. Word today, if you want to go to John chapter 1 with me, I'm going to be looking at some issues. I, uh, some of you may have heard just recently come out a, a study by Ligonier and Lifeway Ministries, a 2022 survey of the state of theology in, a, in America. And they do this every two years. And they come out with this state of theology. Been doing that for several years now. And uh, each year it's a little worse than it was the year before. Uh, each year we, we find out how little America knows about the Bible, about theology, about God, about Christ. And uh, also there's a parallel study, a part of the su study, I might say, the survey that deals with evangelical Christians to find an evangelical Christian is not easy. They do have a criteria, but at least we'd have to say these are the more serious Christians uh, among, uh, even, uh, among Christianity. These are the most dedicated conservative ones uh, that even though the definition is very fuzzy. <clears throat> but as I read this latest survey and I was finishing up a series, I've been going through uh, 1 Corinthians and then I went through Ecclesiastes and then I was finishing up that series and as I read that survey, I thought, you know, I need, we're having a lot of new people come to our church and people that haven't been under the hearing of the word that long. And I thought, I'm, I think I'm going to take a little break from my normal expository going through the book series and instead spend some time on what every Christian must know about certain things. So I'm doing 10 sermons on what every Christian must know about certain doctrinal issues, certain biblical teachings and what I did last week I thought would be very applicable, I hope, for you today, is what every Christian must know about Jesus Christ. In the Ligonier Life uh, Way uh, survey, they asked some questions among these Americans and among evangelicals what they believe about Jesus Christ. And one of the questions is this, is Jesus the first and greatest being created by God? An amazing 50% of evangelicals agree that Jesus Christ was created by God, which means he's not God. Just in case they missed the point, they asked, had another statement that they were to address, and that it's clearer. It says, Jesus was a great teacher, but not God. 43% of evangelicals agreed that Jesus was a great teacher, but not God. These are disturbing numbers, folks, especially when you realize that only 7% of Americans fit the criteria of being an evangelical, and it's a very minimalistic criteria, four questions, four points. And if, if that 7%, of that 7%, if almost half of evangelical Christians believe that Jesus Christ is not God, we're in trouble. We are so biblically illiterate today, theologically illiterate, that it's astounding. And we have to ask the question, what happened to evangelicalism? What's happened to the church? What happened to the church I grew up in and Rod grew up in that was not like that? What has happened? If we go back to the 1970s, let me give you a little history. If we go back to the 1970s, that's when the consumer church or the seeker-sensitive church began. I think still left out on the table there is a book I wrote several years ago called the, uh, uh, This Little Church Went to Market that chronicles all that history. As a matter of fact, there's a new movie out right now. I believe it's in theaters that would chronicle that type of, of history. It's a very complimentary movie. I'm not so complimentary of that period of time. It was back in the 70s when the consumer church was birthed. Many well-intentioned individuals wanted to know how we can reach the tuned out, the t or the turned out on, tuned out, dropped out generation that we now call hippies. Uh, how are we going to reach that group in the 1960s and 1970s 
that were started out in San Francisco and moved forward? How are you going to reach them for Christ? Uh, and it was decided that the best way to reach them was to offer them a Christianity that, that fit their lifestyles and their desires and their taste in music. Most of you young people have no idea that contemporary Christian music as a genre did not exist before 1970. Simply did not exist in the church. And yet that, of course, is very common today. And as a matter of fact, very few know anything different than that. Evangelicalism, based on felt needs, was born. How are we going to reach people for Christ who want very little to do with Christ? We offer them a Christianity that uh, is structured around what they want. And what they wanted was to feel better about themselves, to get approval for their lifestyle, to be told how to be uh, successful, how to have a self, good self-image, some form of the prosperity gospel, very heavily influenced by Pentecostalism. And e because every survey with Barna or Gallup or anybody else said that's what people want in a church. They come to church to feel better about themselves. They come to church to find out how they can thrive and how they can be successful, how they can be happy. If you offer that in a church, people will come and people will be attracted. And they were right. People came to church when that began to be the attraction. What has happened over the years, however, is we have developed a form of Christianity that has been called recently moralistic therapeutic deism. Uh, it's a term that means that uh, Christianity and our churches are moralistic. We want people to be nice. We want people to be better. And so it's moralistic. It's therapeutic because it's absolutely saturated with, the, with, with psychology and therapeutic ideas about how to have a happy life. And it's deistic because uh, not that God is gone, but he just doesn't show up very often. He's not part of my life unless I really need him. If I really need him, then I turn to him. But most of the time, I live my life without him. That's become a common cliche, a common identification found in theological circles for most Christians today and most churches today, moralistic, therapeutic deism. Now, more recently, an interesting phenomenon, if you, will, you can observe this, there's a shift in our churches, churches of any size especially, in which the church is very different than it used to be, they now, have now shifted to two main events, two main things that the church is wrapped around. There is the weekend service or celebration or whatever you want to call it, such as this, where you come together on a Saturday or a Sunday or maybe both and have a weekend event and, and uh, have sermons, you have music, you have programs, you have whatever you want to have, drama or whatever, and that's the big weekend event. The second thing is small groups. Everything else is wrapped around small groups. And therefore, we have a, a, two, a church that is wrapped around a big event and small groups. The weekend service, though, is mostly are wrapped around evangelism, calling the unbeliever or, or the unchurched to come to church. And, and to do that, you give them what they want to hear, the moralistic, the, the therapeutic deism, and the prosperity gospel, one form or the other. And the rest of the church is wrapped around community or small groups. As a result of that, as people come to church on the weekend events, they're not being taught the Bible. They don't even have Sunday school in most of these places or real Bible studies. They don't have other opportunities. And so they're not being taught the Word of God. And small groups which have value, we have small groups once a month in our church. Small groups are good for community, but they're lousy places to teach and learn the Bible. That is not where most people learn the Word of God. And as a result of that, we've developed churches that are biblically illiterate, even evangelical churches, where the Word of God is seldom taught to any extent and certainly not to any depth because people don't want to hear that. And everything's wrapped around these community events, these small groups. And in time, folks, we develop appetites. We develop appetite for what we want. And so our, our church people are, have to been developing an appetite for superficial Christianity. The very, very the, the, just the basics, if that at all. And that's what they want to hear when they come to church. That's what they want to have in their Christian life. They have no appetite for solid biblical teaching. Theology is a dirty word for most Christians today. Give us a good show. Give us a good uh, a lecture on one subject or the other. Have, have a good bit of fellowship. 
And most people are satisfied. And if you don't do that, then we'll just trot on down to the church down the road that will and go there. So it's predictable. It doesn't, you don't have to be a historian, even a historian over the last 50 years. But you got, if you just look back, if you observe, it's predictable that Christianity would become biblically illiterate. That we would be a people that were, we don't know the Bible, where, where bibi, biblical illiteracy is epidemic in our, in our churches, even churches that still preach the gospel. And that anemia is not just too bad. That anemia is deadly to the soul of the individual, is deadly to our young people, is deadly to our churches who do not know even the very basics of Christianity. And it's destroying lives, it's destroying churches. And the bottom line is we now have an evangelical church, whatever we mean by that, who do not understand even the basics of biblical truth. And if you don't believe that, go back and read. It's online, the uh, Theology for Today, the Ligonier Study, and find out how little, how very little evangelicals understand about anything in the Bible today. These evangelicals claim they love Jesus, but let me challenge that. You cannot love someone you do not know. It's a fallacy, it's a delusion, it's a deception to think people will love what they do not know. And so we must return to what Scripture teaches us about all these subjects. We've got to get busy about diligently teaching the Word of God. I know you do that here. I know to some degree I'm preaching to the choir but I'm reminding you of things that matter, I trust. Our subject today is Jesus Christ. What is it that every one of us must know about Jesus Christ? We could turn to a lot of scriptures. I mean, we, there, are whole, there are libraries of books written about Jesus. Uh, there are, the, there's the, if you went to Bible college or seminary, you'd have whole courses on Jesus what a subject. So I'm going to have to limit myself to just a handful of things that every Christian must know about Jesus Christ. And we start with John chapter 1 and verses 1 through 3. What do we need to know about Jesus? First of all, we must know that he is God. It says in this passage, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, all things Come, came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. Every Christian must know that Jesus Christ is God. Now, John begins his gospel by talking about the logos, the Greek word for word. No one else in the Bible does this. Nobody else uses that terminology for Jesus, but John does. And when John does that, the logos at that time was understood in the first century by the Hebrews, by the Jews, as being deity. The Logos was God. The Greeks thought the Logos was the force behind the universe, the impersonal power. Uh, think of Star Wars, the force of the universe. But even more recently, you hear on, the, on TV or whatever, people talking about the universe wants this, or the universe determines that. That's the exact same idea. A, an, an impersonal force that controls even the gods, according to Greek mythology. And so it, this, was that, this is what the Logos was. But in both Hebrew and Greek uh, cultures, it meant communication. God is communicating to us. He is identifying, and, and we're going to see in verse 14, that this Logos is identified as Jesus, just in case you don't know. The Logos is Jesus himself. What do we learn about the Logos? What do we learn about Jesus? First of all, he is eternal. In the beginning was the word. You already, you already know this, right? And so these are, I'm just talking right now. Everybody knows that the son is eternal. Everybody knows that he's existed forever. Everybody knows he's not created. Everybody knows that he is God, right? Except for apparently half of all evangelicals. Did you know that the early church history, that there, there, this great issue of whether Jesus was God was a major issue? The church dealt with this and battled over this. And uh, the most, and 
many did not believe that Jesus was God. That's what was called Arianism. In 325 AD, the, the Council of Nicaea came together to discuss this and determine whether Jesus was God. A, a man named Arius said, no, Jesus is not God. Jesus was created by the Father before time began, before eternity, before creation, back in the past. But he was created. He was a created being. And therefore, he is not God. He's not equal to God. He is not eternal. He is, he is a God, but he is not the God. He is divine, but he is not God, very God of very God. He was created. Athanasius was his opponent. Athanasius stood against him and says, no, the scripture teaches clearly that Jesus Christ has existed from all eternity, that he was not created, that he's co-equal with the Father. He's co-eternal. He's of the same essence with the Father. And for those views, Athanasius was exiled five times from the Christian community before he died. But he won the day, and the Nicene Creed has been written. Arianism was declared a heresy back in the fourth century. And so it's done with, right? Except that every Unitarian in the world believe exactly what Arius believed. Every cult believes what Arius believed. The Mormons believe that Jesus is a God, but not the God. That Je Je Jehovah's Witnesses believe that. Almost every cult believes that. Apparently half of all evangelicals believe that he is not God. He's not eternal. He was created. But what does God say through John? He says, in the beginning was the word. Literally that means that could be translated when the beginning began, the word was already there. Before time, he was already there. And this means that before everything else, even before time itself, the Son existed. And not only that, but in verse 3, he, he, or, he, he created all things. There is nothing that he didn't create, nothing that he doesn't hold together. He's before all things, and he creates all things, and he sustains all things, Colossians chapter 1. There never was a time when the Word was not, and there's absolutely nothing that exists except for his design, power, and creation. So he was the Word in the beginning. He's eternal. Secondly, he was with God. This could be translated, and the Word was face to face with God. That's the closest possible intimacy as you can have. Now, I don't know about you. Have you ever been around a, a close talker? Somebody that gets right up in your face to talk? I mean, there was a sitcom a number of years ago that talked about uh, that, had a whole series, had a whole week on that. Somebody gets right in your face, you know, right, right in your space, and your, your, eye, your eyes are going crossed. You can smell their breath. Yeah, they spit on you a few times. The splash zone was mentioned. How, you, how do you like that? You, do you like it when somebody gets right in your face? I've got a, a person or two in my church that do that. And I back up and I, I back up and I back up and I finally get to the wall. And they got me, they got me there. I want to hit them right in the throat, you know? <laughs> but, but I don't. And if I do that to you, you can feel free to hit me in the throat if you want to. I, I don't like it because they're in my space. I, I don't have a relationship with them. But I like being in my wife's face. I like to kiss her, get right there. I think she likes me. I like my little granddaughters. I, I just love to come up and rub my face with them. I love that because I have an intimate relationship, a love relationship. And that's what it's saying here. The, the, the father and the son had this intimate face-to-face -face relationship like no other relationship possible. And then, and then thirdly, he was, he was God. He not only is eternal, not only was he with God, it says he was God. Now we know that. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 4 says there's one God. The Logos was God, yet he was with God, so what gifts? Well, now we're talking about the doctrine of the Trinity. Do you understand the Trinity? If you do, congratulations. You're the first person to really completely comprehend the Trinity. Do you understand the incarnation? How God became man? How the Trinity functions? How the incarnation functions? No, you don't. There are mysteries beyond our mind, but that does not mean that we don't love these things and adore these things and believe these things. And so he was God. 
How important is that? Look at verse 12. For, by, for as many as received him, to, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe in his name. Folks, you cannot become a Christian if you don't know who Christ is. It, 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 people read this verse, if you receive him, if you believe in him, you can become a Christian. It's a great verse. But who are you believing in? Who are you receiving? You must be receiving the Logos, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. You must know who he is before you can believe in him. That's how important it is. Your very salvation hinges on the knowledge of who Jesus Christ even is. But let's go further. Verse 14 tells us he not only is God, but he's also man. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. Glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Look at verse 17 with me. For, uh, verse 16. For of his fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. And no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him or exegeted him. Now we find that not only is the Logos God, not only is Jesus Christ God, not only is the Son God, but he's also man. He became man, the incarnation. There's two important pieces of information here is, here, he became flesh, the incarnation. Once again, John returns to the word Logos. For the last time in the Bible, Jesus is identified as the Logos. He talked about it in verse 1, now he comes back to verse 14. And he says, and the Logos became flesh. This very one he's declared to be God has now become flesh. And when he became flesh, that word became is a special word. It doesn't mean he ceased being God. It means he took on flesh. And by flesh, he doesn't mean simply the body, the physical body. He means the very nature of a human being. Jesus Christ became the divine man, the God man. And so when, it, when that happened, he had a flesh, a nature that never sinned. But because he was now human, he, got, he had the effects of sin upon him. He got tired. He got hungry. He, he suffered temptation. He died. God cannot die. But the God-man died. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. He is truly human. He is yet fully God. He's the great God-man. He is fully God. We don't understand that in, in totality, but we can adore it. We can glory in that truth. Here's a second piece of information we need to know, and that is that he dwelt among us. He is in, in the incarnation, he dwelt among us. The word dwelt here is a word to pitch a tent or to tabernacle. It could have two possible meanings in our text. One, it could be that it was temporary. Jesus only lived on earth for 30 some years. He tabernacled. He, he, he came among us for a temporary period of time. He, he pitched a tent. Uh, I don't know how many of you like to go camping, and I mean to pitch a tent camping. Some of you go camping and you take your whole house with you. You take, you, you call the, you take your RVs and your campers, you got your colored television, you got your, your, your wonderful bed, you got a shower, you got a coffee pot. You're nuts. That's not camping. Okay, I don't care what you call it. I'm out of here in a few hours. That is not camping. I don't know what that is, but that's not camping. Here's what camping is. I haven't done it in about three years, but I went out in the back of our property at the church. We have a pond back there. We have some lakeage. I go back. I pitched a tent and took five, four or five of my grandkids, and we got in this two-man tent and slept all night in this tent. It was horrible. It was, I haven't done it in three years. I don't plan to do it again till I die, but I might if the kids want to do it. But let me tell you what, it was temporary. I couldn't wait to get up the next morning at 3.30 and take that tent down and go home. It was temporary, all right? Some of you may like to camp. God bless you, you're strange. But it's temporary. So Jesus was temporarily among us. But I don't think that's the main meaning here. Because he says, and we saw his glory. 
Glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Glory. When he said that, immediately all the people that knew the Old Testament went straight back to the Old Testament tabernacle, which is why you must be also a reader of the Old Testament to understand these things. What happened in the tabernacle? Well, I want you to go back with me to Exodus chapter 40. Exodus chapter 40 for just a moment, second book of the Bible. And go to the last chapter in Exodus. And it's easy to remember this little section because it's the very last thing in the book of Exodus. Many things have happened by this time to the Jews. They have now received the Ten Commandments. The sacrificial system is in place. The priesthood is in place. The tabernacle has been built. And it's in place. But something is still lacking. And, that, and we see the fulfillment of that in verse 34 of Exodus chapter 40. The tabernacle is done. It's finished. Verse 34. Then the cloud, what is often called by the Jews the Shekinah glory the presence of God's glory, covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on on it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Drop down to verse 38. For throughout all their journeys, the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and there was fire in it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel." That was the glory of God coming on the tabernacle. And so when John brings up the fact that, the, the ta- that he tabernacled among us, and we saw the glory of God in him, if the reference took a beeline straight to Exodus chapter 40. The glory of the Lord came in physical form, in a cloud form, on the tabernacle. His presence was there in a very special, special sense. Glory, glory means splendor and honor and majesty and that was located at the tabernacle at that point and all the days of the Old Testament travels and the glory stood was in that tabernacle it tabernacled among them and so when we, when we look at that we, and we go back to our passage of scripture in John chapter 1 <clears throat> we see that the glory we now see the glory the glory of the, in the tabernacle was a temporary thing and it was a, basically a shadow of that which was to come. And now the full manifestation of the glory of God is seen not in a building, not in a tent, not in a cloud, but in a person. The glory of God is now seen by human beings in Jesus Christ in a way that no one had ever seen it before. And that is the glory of the incarnation as he came to be among us. And what did that do for us? Well, so many, many, many things. But I want you to note here that when he says this, that that at the end of verse 14, he was full of grace and truth. And this astounding verse 17, you may have missed it in all the, the other wonderful verses that surround it, but this astounding verse 17, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were realized through what? Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ, grace and truth. D.A. Carson is a a very wonderful theologian, written a lot of good books. In his book, The God Who Is There, he told a story about when he was going to college as a a chemistry major in Canada. He's Canadian. And uh, he wasn't a theologian at this point. He was going to be some kind of a scientist. And he met an Islamic man at school. And he became friends with this man, and they talked about, about the things that, of the religion. And they debated, and they discussed, and so forth. And he was a friend with this man. At one year for Christmas, he took this man home to be with his family for the Christmas holidays near Ottawa, Canada. And they spent some time there. And then they had some free time, so they went over to the parliament in Ottawa and took a tour of the, the parliament and the buildings there, and they traveled around, and the tour guide was talking about this, that, and the other. When they got to the end, they came down to the, uh, to the middle there, and there were some pillars, and at the top of the pillars were some frescoes that had pictures of different 
famous people on it. And the tour guide pointed out, it said on one of them, there's Aristotle, because government needs knowledge. And there's Socrates, because government is based on wisdom. And there's Moses, because government needs law. And this Islamic fella had been given a Bible by Carson a, a, about a month before. He'd never held a Bible in his hand ever. And so he was impressed. And he said, where should I read? And he said, why don't you read John, Gospel of John? And unlike many of us who might have just raced through John, he spent a month reading the prologue of John, the first 18 verses, meditating, uh, working through it, thinking about it. And so when he came to this place and they were, they were pointing out the frescoes and these different individuals at the top, this Islamic man who had been reading the Bible said, where is Jesus Christ? And the guy just didn't know what to do. He said, what did you say? And he said, uh, and like many people from another country that speak a little differently, he spoke up louder. Where is Jesus Christ? And the, the tour guide didn't know what to say. He said, why should Jesus Christ be there? And this Islamic man who had been reading the prologue of John said, well, I read in the Christian Bible that the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Where is Jesus Christ? And the tour guide had no idea what he was talking about. Now, this Islamic man who apparently came to Christ later understood a religion and a God of laws. He understood a God of standards, a God of power, a God of terror, a God of judgment, but he had no idea about a God of grace and truth. And his heart had been captured by the Logos, the Son of God, who has realized for us and brought to us grace and truth. So this is who he is. He is the God-man who has brought grace and truth to you and I. Second, thirdly, he is our Savior. You must know he is our Savior. Go to Mark chapter 10, verse 45. Mark 10, 45, in the clearest and most concise statement in the Gospels concerning the coming of Christ, Mark tells us this, 1045, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life, what? As a ransom for many. Jesus Christ came as our Savior to ransom us from sin. If you watch the Super Bowls, you, you probably saw the commercial, and it's on other, other times as well, of a picture, a well-done picture, a well-done drama of somebody going through very difficult times, heartbreaking times, and at the end of the commercial, it says, Jesus gets us. This is a campaign being put on by some very wealthy Christians, including the Greens who own Hobby Lobby. They're putting up a billion dollars to put out that message. Jesus gets us. And so you will see that on television. You probably already has. Now, there's a certain extent where that's good. Jesus understands us. Jesus lived among us. Jesus knows us. Jesus gets us. But my friends, that is not the gospel. The gospel is not that Jesus gets us because Jesus understands who we are. We're lost and dead in sin. Jesus didn't come to get us. Jesus didn't come to empathize with us. Jesus come to save us. And that is a message, quite frankly, of being lost, even in evangelicalism. He come to ransom us from our sins, not simply to tell us that he gets us. Now, in order to understand this, this ransom, what do we need to know? Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let me very quickly mention three things you must understand in order to be ransomed, in order to be saved. First of all, in 15.3, he died in your place. Verse 3 says this, For I deliver to you, as of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. And that word for means on behalf of. It means on, in our place. He is our substitute. He took our place. He took our sins upon himself. 
He took our penalty. He died in our place. You have to know why he came to die in our place. Some of you may have read the book or heard about this circumstance here. There was a missionary in the 1950s who was serving in New Guinea. And he was in a tribe of headhunters, cannibals, who believed that the best thing they could do was kill you, eat your brains, and use your head for a pillow. That's the kind of people he was ministering to there. He had taken the gospel of Christ to these people, and for whatever reason, they let him in. And yet, um, as he gave the gospel, they were so blind and so hardened that when he told them the story of Judas' betrayal of Jesus, they, they determined Judas was the hero and Jesus was the villain. After 14 different bloodbaths that he saw right outside the front door of his hut, he finally determined these people were, were unreachable. They could not be reached for the gospel. They were so hardened in their sins that not even the gospel of Christ could not reach them. And so he was ready to pack it in and leave. But just before he left, by God's grace, he saw an event. The tribal chief of that tribe met with a tribal chief of a rival tribe that they had been at war with for ages. And he brought to that other tribal leader his infant boy. And he gave that son, that boy, to the other chief. They called that child the peace child. And that other chief accepted that child and it brought peace between the two tribes. And there would be no more war as long as those guys lived. He, this missionary saw his opening and he began to present Jesus Christ as God's peace child. God had sent his son to die for them, to bring peace between them and God. God was not their enemy. He had sent his son as a peace child to bring them to Christ. And according to the story, people got, started getting saved. A trickle here, a trickle there, then a flood, and then a great number of people in that area all came to Christ when they understood that God had sent his son in our place as our peace offering. What do we need to know to be saved? Just in case someone here doesn't know, what do you need to know? First, you need to know you're a sinner. Not just that you made mistakes or you do some bad things. You are a sinner. You are dead in your sins. You are corrupt to the core. You're, you're totally depraved. You need to know that first. And secondly, you need to know you're helpless. There's absolutely nothing in the world you can do to, to save yourself. You have no ability. You have no ability whatsoever to save yourself. You're dead in sin. Thirdly, you need to know that Christ did for us well, we could never do for ourselves. He took our sins upon himself. He died in our place. And finally, he offers us the gift of forgiveness of sin, the gift of righteousness, which we receive by faith alone. He came to ransom us from sin. He came to be our Savior. We need to know that. We also need to know, in order to be saved, that he is risen from the dead. Look at verse 4 and that he was buried, and that he was raised the third day, according to the scriptures. I think sometimes when we give the gospel to people, we're guilty of leaving out the resurrection. But go back to the book of Acts. The apostles never left out the book, the resurrection. It was always at the very heart of their gospel. Why? Because there is no good news if the tomb is still filled with a body. There's only good news if the tomb is is empty. We have no gospel, we have no message if Christ did not conquer death. Our message is that Jesus Christ conquered death as no one else had ever done before. I read a story just last week, I'm telling a lot of stories here, but I just thought this story was pretty cool. There was a little boy, eight-year-old boy named Philip who had Down syndrome. He was part of a Sunday school class uh, of, of other eight-year-olds. And uh, they didn't accept little Philip very well because he was different. One, one year, uh, that, that year at Easter, the Sunday school teacher decided to send the kids out on the, in the grounds. He gave them all these little Lego pantyhose eggs. He said, I want you to go out in the grounds and I want you to bring back some evidence, something that would symbolize the resurrection 
and, and life. And so they went out and they, the kids came back with different things and they put them all on the table and they opened up the different eggs. One person had a flower in there. Another person had some grass. Another person had a butterfly. And so they opened them up and, and then somebody opened up one there was nothing in it. And one of the kids said, oh, somebody didn't do the job, didn't do the task. And Philip said, well, no, that's mine. And I did do it. And another kid said, Philip, you're always messing up. He said, no, I didn't. I didn't mess up. I, I, there's nothing in the egg because the tomb is empty. And the kid suddenly realized he was on to something. He was right. And they made him part of the group in ways they had never done before. Sadly, Philip died later that year of a disease, that, of a sickness that perhaps wouldn't have troubled most children. And when uh, they had his funeral and he had his casket up front, the Sunday school teacher led in the whole class to his casket. And they didn't put flowers on his, in his casket. They put empty Lego or uh, eggs, whatever those are called, empty eggs right in the casket to symbolize that the tomb is empty, the resurrection took place, and Philip too would one day be resurrected. What a beautiful story, huh? Isn't that the story that we have here? The tomb is empty. Because the tomb is empty, we, are, we too will conquer death. Here, here's something else you need to know. Go over to Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 20, 25. Hebrews 7, 25. We need to also know concerning our salvation that the Lord is pleading our case. He's interceding for us. Hebrews 7, 25 reads this way, Therefore he is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Christ lives. He is at the right hand of the Father. And what is he doing? Among other things, he's interceding for you and I. He's bringing us to the Father. If I could kind of dramatize this a little bit, we, he comes to the Father with, our, with us, our soul. He says, Father, here's, here's a guy. He's a terrible sinner. He's, he's lost in his sin. He had, there's no reason in the world for you to save him. He, he should go to hell. But Father, I died for him. I came to the earth to ransom him. I bring him to you. I intercede for him. I bring him to your presence, I bring him to be saved. He li ever lives to intercede for us. Here's something else, John 14. Here's something else you must know. You must know about Jesus that he's coming again. John 14, verses 1 to 3, a passage of scripture that comforts us in, in many occasions. In John 14, verse 1, he says, Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that there I am, where I am, there you may be also. We see here this beautiful account that the Lord gives us concerning his coming again. And he says to, to us, if we could again look at it a little deeper, he's saying, look, I'm going to go away, you disciples, but I'm going to come again. And when I come, I'm going to go away to prepare a place for you. And when I come again, I'm going to take you to be with me. And we sometimes get the idea, I think, that, you know, he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. It's going to be wonderful. It's going to be glorious. And he's prepared that for us. And so when he comes for us, when he, when he takes us, he, it's like we, he takes us to our new home. And he, he dumps us off there and he says, look, here, here it is. Here's this glorious home I've built for you. Here's this universe that is yours, this new heaven and new earth. And all that's out there for your enjoyment forever and ever, it's your enjoy. He dumps us off at our new home and he walks away and he says, hey, I'll see you in a millennia or two when I hang out. That's not what it says. 
You see, with all the glories of heaven, all the new heaven and earth, and all he's gone away to create for us as he promised, the glories of eternity is not in what we see and what he's created. It's in being with him. You see, he's coming again. And one day he's going to take all that know him, all that he's ransomed, to be with him and to be with him forevermore. You need to know that because that will determine how you live your life. If you know he's coming again, and one day you're going to be with him forever. That will set the pace for everything in your life and everything that you do. These are things that we need to know about Jesus Christ. At Christmas time, we often sing the song, Joy to the World. That was written by Isaac Watson, 1719, as a kind of a paraphrase of Psalm 98 to go along with his sermon on that subject. Isaac Watts wrote a wrote a song for every one of his sermons, <laughs> and they sang them. We only know a few today, but that's what he did. And Joy to the World is one of those. But that hymn that, that we sang at Christmas is not about the birth of Christ. It's not about the incarnation. It's about the joy when he returns. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. And you and I must know that that joy is awaiting us when he returns. These are things we must know. I hope most of you already knew these things and I've simply reminded you. Some might not. You might need Christ even today. And we invite you to talk to the leadership of the church here about that. But we're finding a world that doesn't know, a Christian world that doesn't even know the basics of the things I've said today. And I hope and pray that you understand these things and you proclaim these things. Father, we thank you now for what we know about Christ, our Lord and Savior, how much we adore Him, how much we love Him. And Lord, we thank you for all that we have in you. Lord, we don't deserve any of this. We, we don't deserve anything. And yet all that we've said today is done because you are the God of grace and truth and mercy, and you've ransomed us from, our, from the dead, from our sin. And you come to take us to be with you. What a joy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As a reminder, we'll have uh, one of our elders down here at the front, uh, right by this door over here, to meet with you if you have any questions.